I am not going to beat around the bush and keep you in suspense. The Planet Crafter is terrific. There's no secret. It's undoubtedly one of the best open world crafting survival games I've ever played. And I'm clearly not alone in this love affair. But with just two developers behind it, you might wonder what makes it so special. How did just two people manage to create such an exceptional game that outperforms major studios? And is it actually as flawless as it seems? That's exactly the questions that I will try to uncover in this video. Right off the bat, let me derail the conversation a bit and address one key question. Isn't this just Subnautica with red filter and co-op? Looking at the gameplay and the premise, the similarity is uncanny. Stranded on a treacherous alien world, having to rely on your surroundings to construct a base and survive. It's all a bit too familiar. And yes, undoubtedly, the Planet Crafter draws heavy inspiration from Subnautica, as evident in the art style, interface and even some gameplay mechanics. But none of that means that it is a clone of Subnautica. The Planet Crafter carves its own path. While it borrows from Subnautica's strengths, it offers a very distinct experience, focused on something entirely different, terraforming a barren planet. So no, this is not a clone of Subnautica in any way. Returning to the main focus of the video. What makes the Planet Crafter so special? The weird thing is that the answer is rather straightforward. It boils down to two core principles carefully designed progression and a player-oriented approach. That's it. These two main points closely intertwined form the core of this game's success. Now let's unpack them. The player-oriented design means that the game prioritizes enjoyment above all else. Most features exist to maximize fun and minimize frustration. The Planet Crafter avoids gatekeeping, roadblocks, grinding or any other artificial time wasters that plague other titles. Instead, it empowers you to freely explore and enjoy its world, while also maintaining a sense of challenge and accomplishment through carefully designed progression. In the Planet Crafter, progression unfolds very seamlessly, with each step naturally leading to the next. Clear objectives are always provided, along with means to achieve them. If you ever feel stuck and think the game expects grinding from you, chances are you're overlooking something obvious. To illustrate this better, let's look at a few examples. At the very start of the game, you begin by producing pressure, which quickly unlocks an oxygen tank, allowing you to explore further and gather materials to construct the first heating machines. Heat, in turn, unlocks improved oxygen production, leading to even better heaters and ultimately upgrading pressure machines. All the while, the general terraforming index increased, granting access to improved power sources for your oxygen, heat and pressure machines. Most of the game follows this pattern. Nearly everything you unlock directly fuels your progress and unlocks something else. This progression beautifully complements the player-oriented design. Whenever you find something lacking and feel the need for a particular feature, the game naturally provides it to you through this well-designed progression system. 
When your storage starts feeling too cramped, you unlock a new one that's more than twice as big. When traveling across the world starts feeling slow, you get an item to speed up your movement. And when that's not enough, the game gives you a jetpack. In many games, jetpacks and similar movement devices are expensive to build, require energy or fuel of some sort, and have other numerous limitations. But not in the Planet Crafter. The jetpack here is very affordable and has no limits. There are no cooldowns and it requires no fuel. You can soar across the map as much as you want without any restrictions. Later, when even the jetpack seems slow due to the extensive map traversal, you unlock straight up teleportation. As soon as you think there are too many things to manage and the game becomes a bit too tedious, then it introduces automatization. Like machines that automatically craft things for you and drones that move items around. These optimization and automation systems are surprisingly well executed. Typically, I am not a fan of automation gameplay. On paper, it always sounds like my cup of tea, but in practice, it often becomes convoluted and tedious after just a few hours of gameplay. Usually, these games refuse to give you tools to truly optimize the process, locking them behind hours of grinding. So you have the vision, but lack the means, and I don't like that. But in this game, it was different. And that I loved. Everything was relatively easy to craft and use, and it was enjoyable to do so. The beauty also lies in its flexibility. The game doesn't demand perfect automation from you. You can easily complete everything without automation, or use it just for some easy to automate tasks. The game respects your time. This genre can sometimes bombard players with new features all at once, and overwhelm them as a result. The Planet Crafter manages to avoid that and strike a remarkable balance. New items unlock just frequently enough to keep you engaged. Yet at the same time, they unlock step by step, preventing you from feeling overwhelmed and giving you too much to do at once. Each new feature feels like a natural progression, building upon the knowledge you've already acquired. This player-centric philosophy extends to the resource gathering and crafting systems. Crafting recipes are generally affordable. This is a refreshing change from games that lock essential items behind expensive resource walls, forcing you to spend hours gathering materials before making any meaningful progress. Take teleporters, for example. In many games, this would be extremely costly, requiring meticulous resource management to build just a few. Here, teleporters are surprisingly obtainable, allowing you to quickly set up a full network. As I wrote this script, I couldn't help but think back to my review of Grounded. In that game, the fast travel option unlocked very late in the game, was expensive to build, required placement on a tower, and even then was pretty slow. Fast travel, a feature that should enhance exploration, ended up feeling like a chore. When playing these other, less player-friendly and more frustrating games, I've often tried to rationalize and justify this frustration to myself. Well, without it, the game would be too easy. It can't just hand everything to you. There needs to be a challenge. The Planet Crafter completely dismantles this logic. 
Here, core gameplay elements like fast travel are readily available and a joy to use. Turns out, this focus on accessibility doesn't diminish the challenge. Instead, it creates a rewarding experience while hiding features behind time-wasting mechanics, grind and frustration, intentionally making the game less comfortable to play and devoid of quality of life features, only makes for a worse game, not a challenging experience. I want to be upfront. All this praise I heaped on the game just now it doesn't tell the whole story. I was basically just focusing on the majority of the game while somewhat omitting the last 20% of the progression. Truth be told, the end stages are quite lackluster and not nearly as well sought out as everything that came before. It seems like the developers had some passionate ideas they wanted to implement and didn't really care about the balance. It's a shame, because some of the late game ideas are genuinely interesting, but they end up not working together. At one point, the game introduces a trading system. You can sell stuff that you produce to make money. This sounds fun and has a lot of promise especially as it ties in perfectly with the automation and optimization features I've already praised. However, in practice, it gets completely overshadowed by another passionate idea, the portal generator. This generator lets you explore randomly created locations. The exploration itself could be more engaging as the wrecks are pretty repetitive and not particularly exciting. But the real kicker is that the rewards are completely unbalanced. You can make 100 times more money in just 10 minutes exploring a high rarity zone compared to optimizing your trades for 3 hours. In essence, a couple of hours spent exploring these randomly generated areas can net you enough Terra tokens to buy everything you'll ever need in the game. This completely throws the trading system out of the window, making it pointless to engage with. This unbalance extends even beyond. The purchasable items are top of the line, making all the efforts spent collecting larva and eggs around the map feel pointless. There's simply no reason to engage with these core mechanics when you can just purchase a superior version with no effort involved. It's a glaring example of how these late game ideas, while brimming with potential, ultimately just undermine each other. What surprises me is how easily some of these problems could be addressed. The randomly generated areas, in particular, are the main culprits. They are already loaded with loot, so just reduce the amount of terra tokens you find there. That way, exploration would still be rewarding, but it wouldn't break the game's economy. This would make crafting essential again. Players would need to craft to make money and they'd also need to craft consumables like sapling sex and larva, since they wouldn't have enough money to just buy everything. However, without the abundance of money, the very end of the game could become unbearable. Strangely, the Planet Crafter borrows an element straight from the Subnautica playbook, an element that was so universally loved and adored. Once you complete all other tasks in the game, the final objective is to grind resources for a couple more hours. The final stage of terraforming, which you reach after 20 to 30 hours of gameplay, requires a staggering 1.25 
trillion terraforming index. But the final unlock that is needed to finish the game requires 5 trillion terraforming. At this point, there's no new content to unlock, no exciting structures to build, just a monotonous grind. Thankfully, exploration money helped us buy a bunch of multiplier fuses to significantly boost terraforming. But without that easy money, the grind could be agonizing. This design choice feels weird. Why introduce a mechanic so at odds with the rest of the game? The exploration money helps with the issue, but it throws the balance out of whack in other areas like crafting. For me, the rationale behind this endgame design choice remains unclear. Even past the money issue, the endgame overall feels a bit rough around the edges compared to the rest of the game. Remember how progression felt smooth and intuitive? That satisfaction subsides near the finish line. For instance, in our playthrough, we first unlocked the amphibian's farm, which is extremely cheap and provides a lot of terraforming. Later, we unlocked the fish farm, which is considerably more expensive and yields significantly less terraforming. Two hours later, we unlocked Aquarium 2, which is even pricier takes up a lot of space and still outputs less terraforming than the extremely cheap amphibian's farm. By a significant margin, mind you. Quite a confusing progression pass, wouldn't you say? Honestly, the whole animal stage wasn't nearly as engaging as the earlier parts of the game. Especially the insect stuff. Grinding for larva felt like a chore particularly the rare larva that lived up to its name a little too well, aimlessly wandering for ages just to collect a few bugs, not exactly a thrilling gameplay loop. Or take the tier 5 drill and hitter for example. You unlock them after everything else in their branches has already been unlocked. Sure, they still contribute to the general terraforming index, but it is still a tad disappointing. It's also thematically jarring. What are we even hitting at that point? The ice is long gone and we've got mammals roaming around. Are we trying to speedrun a global warming apocalypse? On top of that, towards the end, things can get a bit overwhelming. You're juggling production optimization, automating everything to avoid repetitive tasks, setting up separate production lines to sell items, all while also exploring and, you know, actually terraforming the planet by building all the machines and launching rockets. It's a lot to keep track of. It is a strange feeling because none of these issues are deal breakers on their own. But compared to the rest of the game, the contrast stinks. While the majority of the game shines with meticulous planning and execution, the endgame feels less polished. It's not necessarily bad, but considering how brilliant the earlier parts were, it is a letdown. Even beyond the problematic endgame, the Planet Crafter isn't without its flaws. There are a couple of additional concerns to consider. One is the general feeling of occasional clunkiness and bugs. Door stuck! Door stuck! Please! I beg you! With just two developers behind the project, it's understandable that some minor graphical oddities and glitches might pop up. Thankfully, most of these are actually minor inconveniences. Clipping through a mountain or some quirky physics doesn't really break the experience. Unfortunately, I did encounter a more serious bug. I won't delve into the details, but essentially, 
it locked us out of the two extra locations in the game. This could have been a major roadblock, but here's where the Planet Crafter, frankly, impressed. A moderator responded to my post on the Steam discussions within just 15 minutes and had personally fixed my save file, restoring access to the locked areas. Even better, the next patch seems to have permanently addressed this bug, ensuring a better experience for future players. In general, I can categorize most of the problems with the game as underdeveloped. It feels like the developers, while brimming with creative ideas, were limited in resources to fully flesh them out. This results in several features feeling unbalanced, underdeveloped or outright unfinished. A prime example is the cooking system. There's a dedicated station and various ingredients, hinting at a diverse food system. Yet, in reality, most recipes are useless. Let me think. Do I want to combine a single bean and honey into the best food in the game? Or do I want to combine 18 wheat into 3 flour and 18 cocoa beans into 3 chocolates to then combine all that into one single cookie that provides the same nutrition? Hmm. The co-op mod is a pleasant surprise considering it wasn't even initially planned. However, it feels a bit bare-bones. There's no server list, player list or ping system, making it difficult to find and communicate with teammates. Additionally, players all appear identical, lacking any way to distinguish themselves. While these aren't game-breaking issues, there's definite room for improvement in terms of features and overall functionality. This sentiment extends to other aspects of the game as well. While there are many quality of life features present, a couple are noticeably absent. Imagine crafting without needing items directly in your inventory, but being able to pull them from the nearby lockers. Similarly, auto-stacking items into storage instead of manually running around and clicking every chest would be very convenient. These suggestions highlight a broader point – the Planet Crafter can do better. Despite the 1.0 release tag, the game has a sense of unfinished potential. The core gameplay loop is great and additional polish would solidify its foundation. My concern is that instead of focusing on finishing and improving existing elements, the developers may continue to add more unfinished features. But I remain hopeful for the Planet Crafter's future and trust this will not happen. Let's be honest, the Planet Crafter isn't perfect. The graphics are dated, there are bugs, and the endgame could use some love. There's also room for some quality of life features. Yet here's the thing, I adore this game. The reason is simple, the core idea and gameplay are fantastic. Two developers poured their hearts and souls into creating a game they truly enjoy. And this dedication shines through. But they didn't make it just for themselves. They actively engaged with their community and listened to feedback. The result? A welcoming, accessible game that respects your time. No needless grinding, just pure, focused gameplay. And guess what? Turns out that's exactly what many players craved. The best part? It seems that the Planet Crafter is far from finished. Fueled by a successful launch and a passionate community, 
Midju Games is committed to ongoing support. Updates are already rolling out, actively refining the gameplay experience. The future looks even brighter. Ambitious plans for the 1.1 update hint at exciting possibilities. And the team is even considering larger steps, like full-on DLCs. Here's hoping they maintain this momentum. Perhaps in a year or two I'll re-examine this game in a video titled The Planet Crafter Revisited, where I will celebrate the improvements they've made and showcase how the game has truly blossomed. The future of the Planet Crafter is brimming with potential, and I'm eager to see where this journey takes them. This video was one of my shorter ones. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this format. Do you prefer these more concise videos or the longer deep dives? I really hope that you enjoyed the review and if so, please be a cinnamon roll and like, comment and most importantly, subscribe to the channel. Your support actually means a lot. You might also enjoy some of my other stuff, like this Baldur's Gate 3 vs Salasta comparison or my review of modded Terraria.